he's got a similar uh, reaction that most anybody I've talked to about that. What, what on earth? Why? What are you thinking? <laughs> why are considered 60 inch roads? That's just crazy. With all the everything been telling you that we need to go to narrower roads, narrower roads. This is dumb. But you got to give them the name or something to talk about. <laughs> They might not have anything to talk about. I bet they'll dream something up. Anyway, uh, a friend of mine, Rob, Bob Recker, in Cedar Valley Innovation, he'd been doing this for the last two or three years, and, and he and I worked together for, uh, well, we worked at Deer for 30 years, but anyway, on a lot of other projects, and, and I'm usually a cold, wet blanket for him and, and tell him how dumb he is. And, but anyway, this, after looking at the results for several years, this one caught my interest, and so I thought I wanted to try it. He hadn't done much with choke drops, so I added that piece to it. And one of the one of the principles of it is it allows you to harvest more sunlight. You've got that 60-inch row, you've got that open space that doesn't canopy as quick. It allows that sun to come up and it bathes that whole plant, and you allow it lets you harvest more sunlight in there. <clears throat> so I thought, okay, if we can harvest more sunlight. What opportunities might that uh, give us? We look going through there. I'm sorry if I'm standing so much way I move over here. Uh, I'm interested in cover crops. Been doing interseeding for a number of years now, trying to find some varieties that can survive in the 30 inch rows and, and usually by canopy. It certainly limits your opportunities and what you can get in to survive in there. So with 60 inch, get more sunlight, that really ought to open the door up. So give it a try. Also, if you can have more diverse mix in there, give them to survive. So you may have some legumes and some other things in there where you can, if, if, even if you don't generate some nutrients, some nitrogen or something, you may be able to capture more of them. And having more sunlight, harvesting that, you get more biomass, either for soil health or grazing, whichever one that uh, may have the most interest for you. So we set up a replicated trial like in this, and you know, I, I'm not totally risk averse, but I, I really jumped out here and stuck my neck out. I did three acres. So, <laughs> I want to give it a try. So I, uh, I, I planted with the, the 30 inch, just like I would any other corn, for my 60 inch rows. I decided I'm, I, man, and I, my normal planting rate is 35,000 seed per acre drop rate. And 70,000 all in one row just, man, that's dead. So I, I decided. I was going to make them twin rows three inches apart. So I made two passes to, to get that to work out. And you can see the corn coming up there. And, and my, my goal to do it in two passes is that there wasn't any two of those plants winding up side to side. So I did 36 in one row, 34 in the other. Still got my average of 35,000 per acre and make it work. Well, I've got a blank row there. And I thought, man, cover crops are my goal here. So I planted cowpeas in that blank row. As it turns out, we had a cold, wet spring, and cold, wet spring doesn't bode very well for cowpeas, so I didn't get much, and the water hemp overtook it. And so I had to come in and burn that all down and kind of start over with my cover crops. So in the middle of June, you know, you can see the plant there, B4 or so, come back in, and, and I originally intended to do this anyway. I was going to put in a, a six or seven way mix in there, and I had hoped my cowpeas would already be going, but I had to start over and do the cowpeas again. So I put those in the mix, and, and I've got uh, two, two 10 inch rows between each 30 inch row. So there's four between 60 inch row. And there's my machine that I did it with. There is the mix that I put in uh, in, June, in June for the side dress, I mean in the, the center there, the inner seating. And I wanted to have something in the mix that would overwinter. And so I put some of the, the rye, the cereal rye in there. Uh, I also put the annual ryegrass in there, but I've had zero experience in getting that to overwinter. But I thought, man, this gets it in there in June, maybe get some more growth, maybe it'd have a chance. We'll see. And the jury's still out whether it's about or not. But anyway, had all the rest of that, that gives you some, some, uh, Particularly like the buckwheat, it was flowering, it was full of butterflies, it was, they, they liked that really well. So that was my mix. So the results, the yields with 30 inch roll, the means 
were five bushel apart with the corn, the 16 inch corn higher than that. <laughs> Statistically, there's no difference. They were, they were equal. But that's what shocks a lot of people is that they think you're gonna lose half your yield if you do that, but you're capturing sunlight, and so there was opportunity to continue on. And uh, I also had a sensor in there that was measuring the amount of light that's in the row center and the temperature, and I had it mounted one foot off the ground. And so you kind of see the difference there. The 60 inch row had about 15 times more light down at that level than did the 30 inch row. So it gives us more light to capture. And uh, we've got so much light up here, you can't see that very well, but the 30's on the left, 60's on the right. You can kind of see there's a lot more growth going on. This, this picture was taken in October and there's much of that cover crop that had already quit. Buckwheat was all gone, a lot of it. So earlier in the year, there was a lot more there than there was when I actually took the biomass sample. But even at that, the 60 inch row had more than 10 times the amount of biomass there. In addition to that, that biomass had more than 10 times the nitrogen capture. So there's 100 pounds to the acre of nitrogen in those 60 inch rows, the covers in those 60 inch rows. So one of the thoughts might be if you're corn on corn, you just move it over 30 inches and recapture some of that. Uh, did the Sabina test, respiration test, essentially no difference on that. We had cover crops growing in both of them. They were active and going. Uh, soil temperature, uh, you can see a little difference there, but both of them had cover crops going. They did a pretty good job of protecting the, uh, the bare soil. This, these, these were directly under where I was taking the, the uh, sunlight measurements that were buried four inches in the ground. So kind of in conclusion, weed control can be a real issue. In and I guess to back up a little bit, I'm trying to figure out what kind of herbicides I could put down, but having those cowpeas in there brought my options almost to zero. I put a half reed doodle in there and that was a waste of money. It, it just didn't, didn't cut it at all. But uh, so after I you know, burned it all down, it was warm enough cowpeas and everything else come on, they held, held the weeds back, so it was fine then. But the early season weed control is, is really risky on this. Uh, yields is earlier, statistically, they're equal. More sunlight harvested, that's more biomass and more nitrogen because you got more biomass. And my bottom line on this is unless you're trying to build soil health or unless you're trying to graze, because principally of the weed control issue, it's probably not worth it. But uh, probably most of us in the room, those that have livestock, are certainly interested in grazing, and I'm certainly interested in soil health. So there's there's some opportunities there, I think. So looking at what's next, well, it, you know, it, it does. The weed control particularly troubled me, but I want to try to take a look and see if I can't figure out about uh, weed planting the inner seed when I normally have been doing it. I can do some of my pre-herbicides, still get by and take care of that early season stuff and think maybe I can be all right and try to take a look and see what happens. And I'm considering repeating it next year and the reason I say I'm considering it, where I would like to do it, I'd like to do that move over 30 inches, but it's also in a field that I'm going to have in seed corn and if, seed, if I get seed corn contract, it'll be soybeans. So it will be sacrificed, but if it, if I don't get the same <coughs> contract, I will repeat it, move over 30 inches and see what I get. Uh, some other PFIers that uh, were working on it, so certainly uh, contact one of those or a visit one of those, see how, what kind of results they had with it. I don't uh, have their information, so I'm not sure quite how that turned out. Uh, but anyway, I did talk with Bob Record. He had 29 cooperators from Colorado to Ohio and visited with him this morning. And he basically would, would agree with my recommendation, unless you're after soil health or grazing, it's probably not worth it because of the weed control. But he's still getting some of his data in. But in general, the yields are going to be approximately equal. He's, he's hedging some, he's saying plus or minus 10%. And, but uh, he's had some that's been better. And he said of his results, those that had a full replicated trial, the 60 inch typically did better. 
those that were better than nothing, you know, just one pass through the field, the 30 inch did better. And, and he said, in general, where they had cover crops, the 60 inch did better. Where they didn't have cover crops, the 30 inch did better. And I think that's largely weed control. So that's that's a quick synopsis of, of what I asked. Yes? I was curious with the herbicide application in a normal year, if you, um, would you be putting herbicide on after that too, when you planted the cover crop? And generally, I put none after that. Because okay. the, you know, yeah. if you get that cover crop up there, it's, it's holding all of the weed back and it's not needed. I was just curious. I'm sorry, it was a weed control question. I didn't repeat the question. Yeah, okay. wait. So, Strictly from a production standpoint, it may not be worth it if you're just a, a grain crop producer and not interested in soil health or grazing. However, you're using half of the equipment technically because you're only using half of the row units on your corn heads and half of the row units on your planter. If you were to remove those, you're running a 30 foot six row corn head instead of a 12 row. So there's a whole lot less machinery moving. You should be able to harvest at almost twice your ground speed. You're still taking in the same volume. Right, but you're using fewer row units, so technically you're using... But it's still the same volume coming through the combine. And, and his, his question around, you know, you're, you're only using every other row, so you can take, or his comment, I guess, you, you can, you've got less equipment, <laughs> less equipment coming through there, I mean less equipment that you're using, so you can spread that over more acres. Is that essentially what you got? Well, yeah, but the real question behind that is, because you're using less equipment technically, Fewer moving parts are being actively used on your plant, right? at least. Correct. Would it be more economically beneficial to do it this way, just that from a sheer numbers standpoint, because you don't need all those extra pieces now, so you can cut costs and equipment? You're going to drive half the slow planting. You're going to harvest the same speed, so you'd have to go to high speed precision planting for a bit to get back up to the five six mile an hour. Well, you know, I, I think there's some information there that there's some possibilities that you could have some less uh, less equipment involved, and I guess if you only had half the red, the row units, maybe you can afford some of this higher high speed yeah. equipment. So <laughs> there could be some possibilities in there in, in the reduction of the amount of. Uh, Machinery going across the field, I guess another one kind of along that line I uh, thought of is that you got less soil disturbance as you're going across the field as well. So you got fewer row units in the ground. Other questions? Yes? Jack, can you go back and show your picture about interceding the, the covers? I think I either looked away. This one? Yeah. I was putting in one inch. The one inch is, is the seed depth, yes. That uh, Henry machine does move some dirt, so much more than I'd like. I'll be interested to see if you're right over winters. I've been planted that early. You get more winter show when you're right. I have not in the past, where I've got it to survive in the inner seeding. It's, it's done quite well. And, you know, we've had some cold weather, but the winter is yet far from over. It's still going fine so far. And that was the overwhelming question. Yes? I had a question about your your hybrid leaf orientation and then your row orientation. Um, you know, if your rows are running east, west, versus north, south, um, your, where would your blight interception be? And then your hybrid orientation, are you, in this study, were you using more of a widely broad flex type of? Of hybrid or more upright leaf orientation or so his question was around the, the uh, hybrid orientation of the leaf orientation of the hybrid was uh, which way it would go and um, this one I did one last year where I had paid attention to that I, I planted some more vertically oriented leaf orientation versus a more, more prone and initially I thought there was no difference but as I came back uh, this spring I noticed that my cereal rye was much taller where I had this, the vertical leaf orientation than it was in the horizontal. So it makes a difference. In this particular test, the orientation of the rows were north-south and relying on the work that uh, Bob Recker had done, orientation does make a difference. 
you get more sunlight capture out of north south roads than you will east west. Yes. Did you uh, do a visual contrast in the 30s, the ear health versus 60s ear health? You talking about ear health? Yeah. I, I through the latter part of the season, I pulled ears off of both rows, and uh, essentially all along the way there, the you know the kernel count, the health of the ear looked equal. Another question that I often got was the fear that the 60 inch row, there being more dense might be more prone to wind damage. It survived the winds better than the 30s did. Mm -hmm. Count, contrary to what I might have even thought. So. We saw a visual difference, and our weather pattern may have been more extreme, but we, we saw a visual difference between the 30s and 60s, but 60s were much more healthier up here. Your ears or the whole plant? The, well, actually, ears. Okay, okay. So that, another observation there. Other questions? You yes. just mentioned nitrogen as a, a benefit. That means the 60 inch rows had 100 pounds more nitrogen in the cover Cap crops. Captured in the cover crops, yes. But you didn't say that was a reason to do the white rows. Is that buried in soil health or is there an economic benefit there? Um, I think there could be. I don't know how much of that you get back. So, But that that's uh, to be determined, I guess. But if I have the opportunity to come back this spring and redo it, I will reduce my nitrogen and do some tests to see if that see if that really is there by next year. Other questions? Looks like we're running out of time here. Stephanie's getting nervous. It was all put down free. It was anhydrous and I put down 150 pounds, which has been low for me. Normally I'm closer to 200 pounds, but I thought, well, I'll just kind of watch this as it goes. I'm going to start with 150. There was no nitrogen stress. The stock tests were there. The, it, it, the plants had the nitrogen it needed. Okay, thank you. Thanks,